so uh, it's exactly on the on the time. Uh, uh, welcome everyone to our uh, uh, talk this afternoon or whatever the time is wherever you are. Uh, we have uh, an interesting talk from uh, Professor Hamid Reza Tijush. Uh, the title of the talk is Image Search and Nemotoras, a Pathfinder uh, Project. Professor Hamid is a professor at the University of Waterloo. Uh, he's uh, the principal uh, investigator for uh, a Pathfinder project and is director of the Chemia Lab with 25 researchers. Uh, well, it's quite a brief profile. Maybe Professor Hamid has a lot to tell us about himself too through the talk. We hope to hear from you. So we'll now move on to the talk. We hand over the stage to uh, Professor Hamid uh, Tijish. Uh, thank you very much, Franklin, uh, for the introduction. I will uh, share my uh, slides with everybody, and then hopefully um, everybody can uh, uh, see the full screen slides, and then we can start. So as Franklin mentioned, the title of the presentation is Image Search and Pneumothorax, the Pathfinder Project. This is a project that has been started back in 2019, supported by the Vector Institute, uh, performed uh, at the University of Waterloo with support of uh, University Health Network UHN. So the motivation was uh, that uh, basically the misdiagnosis that we see, if you just look at uh, USA, more than 12 million diagnostic errors per year, it's a really large number with ramifications uh, for patients and economy. So 28% of those diagnostic errors could be an are life-threatening and result in death or permanent disability. And to give you an example from a common case like breast cancer, so misdiagnosis costs basically uh, almost $4 billion per year. And that's a case that uh, a lot of resources have gone into it. Of course, medical imaging, using some sort of medical images is, uh, is uh, one of the first steps and a major modality, a dominant way of doing diagnosis and the first detection before any type of treatment can be uh, uh, discussed. And uh, so we are approaching almost a trillion images per year uh, from ultrasound images to OCT to uh, microscopy to X-ray and CT. Many, many type of medical images are being used for diagnosis. If you look at a common case like X-ray, X-ray images are the first medical images that uh, uh, physicians started to use. And if you look at this case, which, where you see in that score, there is a nodule in the lung. And usually we don't see it and we may miss it. And generally we distinguish between different types of error. So one is a scanning error that we fail to fixate and we fail to see it basically. And sometimes we see it, but we, we cannot recognize it. So we, 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 we fail to detect it or perceive it as an abnormality. And most of the time is a decision-making error. So we see it, we find it and we see it, uh, but then we don't know whether it is malignant or benign. So uh, it's, a, it's a very common error for many diseases, for many problems. So in our case, we are talking about pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is when usually one or sometimes both lungs collapse. A collapse could be partial, very minimal, small, or could be large. So when we talk about pneumothorax, the collapse or dropped lung, that's an emergency situation uh, that can uh, can be quite dangerous. So that's generally a category one finding, which means uh, people have to uh, uh, take some immediate action within minutes. Um, and of course, as such, pneumothorax is generally a very serious condition and people could die uh, if the lung collapses. And typically, uh, the X-ray images are uh, being inspected by qualified radiologists is, is a major way of uh, when people come to the hospital or the emergency room with some uh, complaints, this is the first way to look at the chest and see whether something is wrong with the lungs. The general detection rate by radiologists is below 50%, which is in 50% of the cases, 
we don't even see it. Because why? Because it's very difficult to see, it, especially if it is a small collapse, if it is a partial collapse. You can easily miss it. And uh, things are not very visible in X-ray images. So back in 2019, Vector Institute created multiple Pathfinder projects. And one of them uh, was the pneumothorax between Kenya Lab at the University of Waterloo and UHN in Toronto to see what type of AI technologies can help to, um, to uh, find detect pneumothorax as an emergency situation. If you look at some images here on the left normal patient and on the right pneumothorax patient, you see, you realize it's, it's not like you have a chunk of, I don't know, different color pixels that you can easily recognize. When you see the, the arrow is the part that you see a slight uh, increase in darkness and that's where you can recognize, oh, the lung has collapsed. And that's a relatively easy case. Uh, so it's a relatively large collapse. And you see uh, on the right, you see that uh, uh, the left lung uh, lobe is basically collapsed and you can see it in the contracts. Well, an expert radiologist can see it at least. If you look at the majority of normal patients versus normal thorax patients of different degrees of collapse, it's really difficult to, uh, to distinguish between normal lung and uh, uh, a collapsed lung. So it's not, it's not a case that uh, you, can, you can teach somebody within minutes how to do it. Compared to, for example, COVID-19, if you have pneumonia in COVID-19, you can basically train a, a young radiologist within minutes to say, oh, this is pneumonia because of, uh, because of COVID-19. Pneumothorax is much more difficult than that. So if you have a large collapse and you look at it at, at CT instead of X-ray, you see here that it's basically black. So that's where the lung collapses, then there is nothing there. So it's air. Uh, and there is no absorption of uh, uh, X-ray. So you see it as black, as completely, if I use a, a terminology from ultrasound, anechoic. So there is nothing being uh, absorbed. No X-ray is being absorbed. So you see it uh, on the right, you see it where the arrow shows the completely black because the lung has collapsed and has been, is, is much smaller now. So, but of course, this is this is this is a very drastic one, and usually we don't do CT uh, uh, because CT is usually not available in emergency rooms. So we go with X-ray. Okay, so how can AI and its learning eventually help to uh, to detect uh, problems like pneumothorax? Well, learning, as you, many of you know, we have different type of learning. We have supervised learning, unsupervised learning, weekly supervised learning, and sometimes we call unsupervised learning self-supervised learning. Um, so uh, the supervised one, we have our algorithmic ones that are typical machine learning. We have topological ones, which are basically deep networks, different versions of deep networks. When we talk about unsupervised learning, we fundamentally mean clustering and search, sometimes also visualization. And when we talk about uh, weekly supervised learning, we, uh, we mainly uh, have an active and online learning in mind. So depending on we, we, which one of these uh, schemes you go, and you may have different, people may separate self-supervised learning uh, as, a, as a fourth category. So, there may not be agreement how many different level of learning we have, but supervised versus unsupervised are two major groups, of course. So uh, when we talk about supervised, that means you have a teacher, you have labeled data, everybody knows that. If you have weekly supervised, there are some interaction and uh, the AI agent, so to speak, receives reward and punishment to guide it uh, through the landscape of learning something. And when we say unsupervised, there is no teacher. The data is raw, and you have to just start doing something uh, and uh, basically recognizing the underlying pattern in the data. So if you want to use supervised AI for pneumothorax, you have to label images. So this four masks that you see, 
the, the white pixels that you see in each of the four images is the mask that radiologist has created for pneumothorax. So it says, if you look at those corresponding location in the X-ray image where you, you see here um, white, basically in the uh, X-ray image, you have the pneumothorax. So if you wanna have a supervised AI for detecting pneumothorax, you need thousands of these masks. So, and who has done it? Radiologists. Radiologists have to sit down and come up with annotation or labeling. And from left to right, this becomes much more difficult to detect. On the, on the right, you have a large pneumothorax. Usually you see it relatively easily in the X-ray image. On the left, you see a relatively small pneumothorax. That's very difficult to, to detect. So, okay, when we, when we talk about the misdiagnosis, that's basically observable variability, which means, uh, which means doctors may disagree. So when they disagree, when there is variability in decision-making, that's an error. So if, if we give an image, any X-ray image to a classification, and the classifier tells us yes and no, or gives us a probability what absolute majority of deep networks do, what we are saying basically is that many physicians have to accept what AI is saying. So AI makes a decision, says yes is pneumothorax, or no is not pneumothorax, um, and I, I'm using a general image of broken uh, bone, not pneumothorax, because it's about general classification concept. So the doctors basically have to accept what AI says. Okay, well, as an AI uh, um, uh, researcher or engineer or computer scientist, you may be perfectly all right with this, but you are ignoring the fact that physicians have to put their own knowledge aside and trust AI. Why should they do that? Well, most of them may not do it. Most of them actually are not doing that. So the core uh, concept of classification is, I tell you what it is, take it or leave it. So, and of course, the user acceptability of this could be quite low. So, we could use search as an unsupervised uh, technique. So, if the radiologist is looking at an image as a query send it to an archive of big image data, and some sort of unsupervised AI techniques to match that input image, the query image, to billions of images in the archive, in the packs of the hospital or a network of hospital, and then they come back with similar images instead of making a decision. And not only they can come up with uh, medical images, similar cases, they can also go in the radiology information system or hospital information system and also bring back corresponding metadata. That's diagnostic reports, uh, treatment plans, outcomes, anything that you uh, is available about the patient. So, which means you bring the similar anatomy and similar uh, uh, abnormality plus the evidence of the past case, who diagnosed it, what was the diagnosis, who, how did we treat uh, the condition and how successful was the treatment. Very different from uh, classification, which means when we search, a physician basically has to accept what many other physicians say, not what the AI says. So that's a fundamental uh, difference. And uh, in, in Akimia Lab, we have almost entirely focused on search because we realize uh, enabling physicians and clinicians to tap into um, to tap into the existing knowledge, which is evidently diagnosed cases in the past, is much more acceptable than asking them to uh, trust what AI is saying. So um, search as a, as a fundamentally unsupervised AI technology uh, gives access to the evidence of, of the cases from the past and does not make a decision by itself. It could. As we will see, it could, if you wanted to, we could make a decision. But before that, so basically you have to come up with some sort of representation, image representation, which means you have to make the computer 
understand what the image is about. So there are basically two approaches. One is conventional approach, and I'm showing you just an arbitrary case from our own work that you get the image and you do many, many steps and you design it. So that's handcrafted features and you come up by the end something at the bottom right, which we call histogram of encoder local projections. We had other things like SIF, SURF, LBP. So these are handcrafted features. I don't want to go in details of this, but I wanted to show you a picture that such a thing takes many steps. And each one of those steps has been designed by an engineer or computer scientist. So this is conventional image representation. It doesn't work that very well with difficult cases in medical images. So what we do, we use deep embeddings or deep features. So images go into some sort of um, deep topology. And instead of using the class, which is the output from inside the network, we grab some deep features. Many, many people are doing that and they take that, those deep features and use it for different purposes, for visualization, for analysis, for clustering and so on and so forth. So if you take, uh, which means it's still, you are doing supervised learning to get to those features, yes. So that's a problem right now. That means even if you wanna do completely unsupervised learning, you cannot do it because for if you use deep embeddings, somebody has trained that network for some purpose such that you can extract deep features. But we are hoping that through domain generalization, uh, the dependency on supervised learning can, can be reduced. Okay, so what is the idea here in this, uh, in this Pathfinder, Pathfinder project? We, we, we came up with a, with, with, with a concept that let's remove the misdiagnosis while building consensus. So using search, unsupervised AI. So, and you see in the phase one that images come to go through some sort of network here, we use DenseNet because it's a, it's a compact capable network pre-trained on ImageNet, which are non-medical data. And then you get deep features for every image. And in the second phase, when we do image search, again, the core image, the new image goes through the DenseNet. Again, you get deep features. You compare that with all deep features in your database and you come up with a top K similar images. So if you come up with top K similar images, then you can build a majority board. So that's classification, isn't it? Yes, it is. But you may or you may not do it. You leave it to the, uh, to the user, to the radiologist. He or she may decide to just look at the similar cases and come up with a diagnosis just by himself or by herself. Or he, if the radiologist asks, you say, okay, what do you think? You can look at the majority vote among the top K similar cases uh, to basically come up with a classification, but the radiologist is looking at similar images. So, and we were looking at, okay, should I use the entire image like at the top? Should we break it down because uh, the chest is quite symmetrical, left long, right long? And we calculate basically deep features for the left long and right long without, without segmentation. We didn't want to bring, again, supervision into this. Or at the bottom, basically, you get three deep feature vectors, one for the left long, one for the right long, and you flip it, and then one for the entire image. And we want to see which one is providing uh, better image representation. So you have to. No AI technique can solve any problem unless the data is represented adequately. So, and uh, our solution was what we called Autotorex Net. So the image comes, you look at the left long, you look, look at the flipped right long, and you look at the entire image, you take basically three deep feature vectors. It could be coming from a pre-trained network, that's okay. You concatenate those uh, three deep uh, feature vectors, you get more than 3,000 features. You push it through uh, 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 autoencoding structures, and then uh, you classify it, let's say, as normothorax or not normothorax. You know, 14 other diseases, common diseases for the chest. You can classify it as anything you want. But what you will be using is not the classification. You will lose, use that black um, rectangle that you see with 256 
dimensional FV, which is feature vector. So you get a feature vector for image search. And so the top one, the top gray structure, which is the second half of the outer encoder, you just uh, throw that away. You don't need it. So you have trained it, and then you just use the feature vector, the compressed feature, concatenated feature vector as uh, an image representation for each three images. So you can train this. And of course, you have image level labels. You don't have pixel level labels. So you don't need to know where the normal thorax is. That's a huge benefit. So you can still do supervision without label, actually, if you do uh, image level label. So that's soft label, basically. Many people uh, are, you, are doing that. And then you, do, you need to do some serious experiments. So and, uh, you, you realize I'm implying that there are experiments that are not serious. Of course, there are many experiments that are not serious. So uh, the first level of seriousness is, is the size of the data, the diversity of data. We put uh, uh, three publicly available data sets together. And so it was a total of 551,383 X-ray images um, with 14 type of diseases and also normal or no finding. So, and we use that in two different ways. So, uh, and we calculated what in medical community, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, with we call it sensitivity and specificity. So we wanna find the true positive cases that are actually pneumothorax. We don't wanna find an image that is not pneumothorax. We call it pneumothorax, that would be false positive. So sensitivity is that you find every image that is pneumothorax but you should also not call anything else pneumothorax. So if you, just if you just name every image, label every image that comes pneumothorax, your sensitivity will be 100%, but you are not very specific because then you are, you are naming many, a lot of other stuff, let's say pneumonia uh, or asthma, you are calling them pneumothorax as well. So you are, you are very sensitive, but you are not specific. So, you have to, yeah, you don't make that distinction generally in classification. So in the medical field, we are a bit more, uh, bit more rigorous in that regard. And if you use sensitivity and specificity, you can construct something that people call receiver operating characteristic curve, ROC, uh, and uh, the area under this curve, AUC, um, should be approaching 100%. And then you have a perfect solution. So 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity, which doesn't happen in reality. You always have to find that corner that is close to 100% sensitivity on this curve. That's the best you can do to find a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. So we came up with a semi-automated solution uh, for uh, normal thorax, so, which means if you have a gas, if you're suspicious, then we can compare your input image with normal images and normal thorax. And the accuracy here was around 92%. If we go up to 1,000, about 1,000 similar cases. So we, we retrieved 1,000 similar cases from half a million images. And then the statistics were reliable to reach accuracy of 92%. If you want a fully automated solution, so if you don't have a guess, if you're not suspicious of anything, and every image that comes in, we match it against everything else, then the accuracy was around 82%. You cannot really go above 90% 90, 90 when you are fully automated. So that means you have no idea what that is, and still you retrieve more than 1,000 cases to have reliable statistics, so you get to 80%. While well, that's still compared to average sensitivity of 40% of radiologists, that's really good. That's not bad. So you double basically the sensitivity, which is, which is good. So we have published the results. Uh, the results are publicly available. Uh, if you go to Nature Scientific Report and search for a pneumothorax, you can uh, see and uh, download the paper. Uh, Antonio and Optin uh, have been uh, crucial for this project and uh, the, all the details of the uh, technology that I talked about are in this. I didn't go in any detail. Our observation in general at Kimia Lab with supervised AI and unsupervised AI, if I use the pneumothorax project as a pretext, 
there are many differences. So first of all, of course, AI needs labeled data. Unsupervised can operate on raw data. That's a huge advantage. The location is usually highlighted. Uh, the location of whatever you're looking for uh, is highlighted by supervised AI, but unsupervised AI does not give you a location. That's a, that's a disadvantage for unsupervised, if that's important to you. Uh, if you do external validation, unsupervised AI is really bad. It collapses. Right? Any deep network that you train and it gives you 99% accuracy in testing, if you apply it on data from other hospital, it considerably drops. Unsupervised AI also drops, but is not that bad. is is less sensitive to external validation, which is an unseen data from other hospitals. So. Uh, supervised AI is very sensitive to bias. Unsupervised AI is also sensitive to bias, but not that, not that sensitive. So we see more robustness uh, with respect to external validation and bias when we compare supervised AI and unsupervised AI to the benefit of unsupervised AI. Supervised AI has, a, has an attitude of take it or leave it. You know, that, that's what doctors don't like. So, uh, Take it or leave it. So the, the super smart, gigantic, uh, 300 million weight uh, heavy uh, deep network has made a decision and says that's pneumothorax. So you have to accept. Well, I don't want to accept as, as a human being. So what should I do? Unsupervised AI usually just makes recommendations. So, and you, you, you don't even need to take the recommendation. It can just show you the data, the evidence, and you can, make up your mind based on the match cases, based on the search and cluster results. So very, very different. And it's not just usability, user friendliness. It's not just user acceptance. Supervised AI is assuming that with yes and no decision, basically, the problem is solved. It's not like that. Radiologists, like pathologists have to write reports and justify why they are saying it and they have responsibility to do so. So the concept of take it or leave it will not work uh, very well. So of course, supervised AI, the prize for that 99% accuracy that people report is they are highly organ and disease specific. They, you train them for one specific thing. You train it for pneumothorax, you train it for COVID-19, you train it for pneumonia, you train it for asthma. So it doesn't work for anything else. But unsupervised AI is completely agnostic to organ and disease, so you can apply it on anything. So that's a fundamental advantage for unsupervised AI. So I can, uh, unsupervised AI is a platform. Supervised AI is a technique. Very different. And of course, unsupervised AI is very difficult to explain. And I'm not sure those heat maps and uh, activation maps that people superimpose on images and they make them red and green, they are not helping much. That's not explanation. Whereas the unsupervised AI, when we search the metadata of previous matched cases, is evidence that you can show and is, is material for discussion and elaboration for, uh, for the radiologists. So very, very different things. So, okay, based on this, what are we expecting after the pandemic? So last time we had the pandemic, and if you have time, uh, read this book, that's about the Spanish flu, uh, excellent book. I don't know the author, I just have read the book, so I found it fascinating. So a lot of things happened after the Spanish flu. Um, we got the socialization of medicine and healthcare, the epidemiology emerged as a significant discipline, and we established baseline health of population. A lot of things change, and we are expecting that a lot of change, a lot of things will change after the COVID-19 pandemic. So what's coming based on everything that we know from our experience? We will have a lot of changes in population health management strategies. We will get more high demand for telemedicine and remote patient monitoring. Uh, we will increase, of course, increase the cloud deployment. Many major hospitals are doing that. We need a lot of high performance storage. Hospitals cannot do that anymore. We need to be able to shuffle data around and process them in a short time. We need to exploit biobanks and repositories, taxed 
and hospitals have a large number of images. Nobody's using them. Nobody's tapping into them. We need to do that. So uh, if we will get pervasive use of unsupervised AI because they are more acceptable, but we will also get selective use of supervised AI. Supervised AI to me is low hanging fruit. It gives you 99% for a specific case. You cannot explain it. You need other stuff, but it's good. And we can get a lot of things done uh, with it. So our work has been supported by Ontario government, uh, Vector Institute, UHN, uh, many several hospitals. And uh, without that help, uh, this, uh, this result would not have been possible. So I will start, uh, stop here and hopefully this has been uh, useful. I'm assuming if there are questions, people can ask questions. Sorry, I was trying to get in, uh, Professor. Thank you so much for your talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for that explanation. And uh, so we just encourage anyone that has any question to put that in the chat. Then I will relay that to the professor. And then he will answer our question. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, Professor Hamid, uh, is it okay if we can put your email in the chat box in case someone wants to reach you for further information? Sure. Is that fine with you? Sure. Okay. And okay, that's fine. Uh, additionally, also, thanks so much for that. Uh, additionally, I saw the paper that I kind of published your research. Uh, is it publicly available? Uh, yes. Or does it have to register? In nature? Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. I saw it's a nature paper. So like I was thinking it's kind of uh, something how to get resource questions. So we're waiting for questions from uh, the participants and then hopefully we'll relay it back to you. Mm. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Uh, okay. I think we're waiting for questions. Uh, meanwhile, I, I was trying to know more about the uh, your your institute. Sorry. I was yeah. if you can maybe can highlight more about the. What the Pathfinder project is all about? Is it? Uh... Well, the uh, Vector Institute created six Pathfinder oh. projects of uh, duration of one year, and that was prolonged through the COVID 19. And the purpose was to deploy uh, AI to show what is, what, how AI can solve real world problems, among other in the medical field. And uh, so tough. Uh, uh, intentionally really difficult uh, problems were, were selected, such that everybody knew it's not easily doable without anything else. So, and um, ours was no motorics because again, so we know that um, the sensitivity or accuracy of radiologists are quite low for detecting no motorics. Okay. Okay, that's good. So, I, so a question from yeah, from from uh, Kofi Marco said, uh, are there any next steps with this project? Uh, and there, are there any areas of improvement? Yeah, the next step is we are in, in, we are about to install. Uh, next step is to install the search engine that we have developed at uh, one of the hospitals in UHN. The uh, the doctors, radiologists are supposed to use it, work with it, and then we validate it again and see what problems there are. They wanna. They want to uh, uh, complement it with supervised AI, which is detection. Also, just don't tell me that they are similar. Also, show me where that is. So, next step okay. would be validation of search and adding detection, which is a supervised AI. Um, right. Then validate and see where our problems and continue to work. On. Okay. Thank you. I, I was also listening to your talk. I you mentioned something about. Uh, super, unsupervised AI is a platform and the supervised AI is a technique, like a difference. So maybe, is there any way you can maybe put more explanation to that to understand how unsupervised learning is just a platform, right? So, so if you have a technology that you can take it and apply it on uh, any problem within a domain, and you have a platform, 
But if you have a technique that for every given problem inside that domain, you have to train it from scratch, not supervised AI, and that's not a platform. That's just an algorithm. Any deep network that you train and recognizes a skin cancer or a normal thorax. So because you take thousands of images and you train it for that one task, well, that's a technique. That's one method. It's not a platform. So it's not a platform that can inside millions of images unsupervised and figure things out. So that's a platform. Why do you think uh, search technologies are so pervasive in everyday life? Because search is a platform. It's not a technique. Oh, okay. Okay. That makes it more clear. Now. I think I, I get that part of the discussion. Thank you for that clarification, too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so de definitely we'll let our viewers know that if they want to reach you, uh, if they want more questions, they can reach you on your sure. um, uh, through email. So we'll get more explanation about this project and then hopefully uh, we'll follow up on that. But uh, in, uh, so thank you so much uh, for the thank talk. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Great. hopefully we'll get to see you again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Take care. Uh, okay. Bye. Bye.